a woman tells her child that he's been judged as incompatible. Terrified, he asks if there's something wrong with him and promises to fix whatever he has to. Despite all his begging, she mercilessly drives him out of their home. Zuki dreams of the woman, bidding him good night. He's awoken by a lovely voice. It's Kanon, sitting by his bedside, and worriedly asking why he looks so tired every morning. Turning over, he says that he really is tired, and wouldn't mind if she let him sleep more. She gets up, unwilling to grant his request, and believing that he isn't really sleepy. The girl tells him to change his clothes, and come to the kitchen for breakfast. He does as told and soon makes his way to the dining table, where she's already prepared their meal. Surprised that the boy actually sat down, she tells him to eat quickly, but he declines eating altogether. Still ignoring her invitation, he says she can order him to eat if she wants to, and acts very particular with how she orders him around. Annoyed, she hastily eats his share of breakfast instead, and suddenly stops, as she feels embarrassed by how he's watching her eat. He says he's seen her stuff her mouth ten times before, and that the eleventh time isn't any more embarrassing. Feeling humiliated, she shouts at him to wait outside, if he doesn't plan on eating with her anyway. They walk through the busy town later on, and Kanon is captivated by an Edelite coil in a store, considerably cheaper than usual. The girl then goes on about getting more out of the ore, depending on its purity. Looking through the window, she sees that they're also selling gears as beautiful as the perfect starlit sky. She's surprised to see that there's also a galaxy gear, something most shops don't even carry anymore. As she's planning to return to the store on their way home, she bumps into a man and falls. The kind girl apologizes, but Zuki says it's just a cleaning automata, and that there's no need to apologize, since the 80s, wind-up automata have become an indispensable part of the workforce around the world. The law dictates that a mark, indicating the application of automata, be engraved on its neck. In Hellwaitz's capital city, Jessel, he once saw more of these dolls than humans. Their bus arrives, and the driver mechanically asks for their ticket, when she isn't able to give it right away. In general, the dolls were made to behave in a set way, making it impossible to communicate freely. Kanon wonders where her ticket is, so he recalls how she put it in her bag after coming home from school the day before. She's relieved for a moment, but he adds that it must have fallen out of its pocket after she hit the cleaning automata earlier. She frantically complains about him not mentioning it earlier, but he assures her that they can still find it, although it might have been cleaned up by the automata. Annoyed, she pulls him out of the bus, forcing her to help with the search. A while later, they fortunately make it to the National Hayden Academy somehow. While she's just glad to have made it in time, Zuki scans the area thoroughly, checking out enemy positions. Hearing this, she scolds him, as she's repeatedly told him that they aren't on a battlefield. Also, the people around them aren't bad people, as the war is long over. Whatever happens, they need to be careful. In the classroom, she's shocked to find her desk completely vandalized with inappropriate words. The poor girl sadly rubs it off in silence as her classmates snicker while watching. The teacher arrives, and begins a lesson on how humans and vampires have built a friendly relationship, a stark difference from the world before. He says this, but for Zuki, they're still the enemy. Vampires are demi-humans that live a very long time, able to use magic by ingesting the blood of other creatures. They'd been hiding for the last 2,000 years, but they once conquered Germany in only 10 days and invaded other countries outward. However, the tides of war were completely changed by Japan's creation of the combat automata. The five doll knights were called the Bakuden, and it's said that they were created by the genius engineer, Harami Bakuden. The elite group was able to defeat the vampire army and recapture the conquered lands. However, no one could stop them from running wild. The vampire king eventually reached out to sign a peace treaty, leading the doll knights to be destroyed. As he finishes the retelling, a student named Dinkle interjects, suggesting that his light perception of the automata slaughter is dangerous. Even though the vampires invaded first, the crimes of the automata after cannot be overlooked. It was the use of the galaxy gear that caused them to run wild, and these days its use has become an implicit taboo for engineers. She looks at Canon and says that there might still be people with malicious intents to use it, despite the taboo. Continuing, she states that they should learn from history, and never again create automata that are capable of such slaughter. The lecturer agrees, recognizing the tragedy that happened. Two years after recapturing the municipality of Neuendorf, the dolls ran wild for three days, and slayed both humans and vampires. Their creator also saved many lives with his hands, which is why it was called the Tragedy of Kellner. Ironically, had they not run wild, then the peace treaty would not have come to be. Hellwaits is said to be the most peaceful country in the world, and they should all be proud. However, Zuki believes that the country is too peaceful. 
Later on, the lecturer apologizes to the boy for suddenly borrowing his princess like that. He says that she's his cousin. The man whispers to Canon, addressing her as Miss Sanderhals and telling her to rely on him for anything as he's under the Archduke's orders. While she should be safe with Zuki, the Archduke is worried about them living under the same roof. With a scary expression, she questions the priority of his concerns. They leave, advising him to be careful about letting the truth of his origins leak to anyone. Later on, Kanon shares how someone suggested that she enter the high school automata contest. In the country, each high school competes with their own automata, showcasing their originality and technique. The merits of winning would include guaranteed admission to prestigious universities. She feels bad that he refused, and he says he thought she'd want to join as she was talking about it. While she wants to enter the contest like her mother, it might be impossible because the competition requires teams of three for participation. As she talks about meeting someone to work with, Dinkle and a few girls appear from the window above. They shower her with buckets of water, snobbishly apologize for having their hands slip. The girl mocks her, saying she hopes that her notebook got wet. Since it only contains notes on the automata slaughter, she says it'd be better if she just threw it away. Trembling from being soaked and embarrassed, Kian calls to Zuki, scolding him for not warning her about the bucket, despite him clearly seeing what was about to happen. He nonchalantly explains that the water will dry over time, and that she wasn't in any danger. Dumbfounded by his reasoning, she calls him inflexible and says she wants to use a different route home. Since she can't go home drenched, the girl tells him to wait as she changes into a jersey. Her real name is Kanon Bakudin, the daughter of Harami Bakudin, creator of the Bakudin Automata. Even if she hides her real name, she truly believes in her mother's innocence. She's accepted the prejudice from the people around her, considering it atonement. The girl has given up on the world and fighting. Other than that, he's inflexible. She arrives later on, wearing her gym clothes and ready to leave. On their way home, they pass by a small construction site. Just then, a metal rail comes crashing down, nearly hitting the girl on the head. They turn towards it and see a construction automata running wild, ignoring orders to stop. If the order isn't working, it likely lost control due to old age and the army will surely dispose of it. Knowing that it's too dangerous if they get close, Kan tells Suzuki to go. His eyes light up and a smile spreads across his face as she says something about him fighting it. He immediately turned to stop it, ignoring her command to wait. He assures her that it'll be fine as the machine will break anyway. With this, he sets off. History says that the Bakuvin were composed of five units, but that was a lie. In the fight against vampires, there were actually six units created, Mitsugi, Kisaragi, Aoi, Yuzuki, Setsuki, and the sixth unit, Zuki. The boy was not made to enjoy the peace of the current world, and now he has a chance to let loose once more. Facing the large construction automata, he switches to combat mode. He's an automata built for battle, the last remaining Bakudan unit. His eyes change and his power is released. The construction automata's shadow approaches Zuki, smashing a metal rail where he stands. The automata's codename is Hercules, and it is an anti-vampire combat automata, modified during the war. He dashes past the attack quite easily, and takes the colossal doll down with a single swift kick, Making his way on top of its chest in no time, the boy releases a blade from his sleeve and drives it down, knowing that nothing can compare to him in fighting. The blade goes deep into its chest and the coil of the enemy. The power source of each automata is their coil, and destroying it renders the machines incapacitated. He looks behind him and leaps high as he sees several more malfunctioning construction automata roaming around the site. Still in the air, holes appear out of his knuckles, and the target is the owner recognition chip on the back of their neck. With a precise shot, the second opponent falls. There are more than 20 left, so he quickly gets to work, dashing through and hitting them all in the right spots. Soon enough, 10 are taken out, then 18, and finally, all 25. His face grows solemn, dissatisfied by the fight. Just then, a voice echoes, announcing the arrival of the Republic Army. Leading them is a dignified woman, with burning red hair and an unmistakable flower emblem. He's quickly surrounded by armed women, the leader says that she isn't concerned about the sight, instead asking him why he's there. Knowing he can't reveal who he is, he reasons that he's just passing by and wanted to see the malfunctioning automata up close. She scolds him, saying it's crazy to get so close just for entertainment. Moving on, she asks how he beat them all and raises her sword as he feigns ignorance. The woman assures him that she won't be misled, adding that an automata running wild cannot be stopped unless they're destroyed. He proposes the possibility of another squad, having handled the situation before they arrived. Unfortunately, she knows that they're the first responders and tells him not to be so humble. 
However, he has no weapons on him, so it's doubtful for him to take on so many at once. Realizing something suspicious, she smiles, seeming to have figured out his identity. The woman comes closer, inches away from him, and says she won't be sure until she checks. If her intuition is correct, it'll be an amazing discovery. Just then, another automata appears, and the army immediately moves to attack. Capitalizing on the distraction, Zuki slips away, and the commander is unable to do anything, as she has to handle the situation at hand. He exits successfully, and Kanon tries to scold him. However, he pulls her away in a rush to escape, promising to explain later. On the construction site, the Scarlet Maidens fall in for the fight, allowing the two to flee successfully. The girl asks why they're running away so fast, and is shocked to know that someone from the troops figured his identity out. Fortunately, she couldn't afford to chase him. The girl says he didn't have to help the Republic Army, but he states that he did no such thing. Moving on, the eyes of anti-vampire automata are equipped with thermal sensors, making a vampire's body glow bright blue in their eyes, just like the commander from before. In other words, the world has changed so much that there are now vampires in the army. At home, Kanon enters Zuki's room, carrying something suspicious with her. She says he did something unforgivably selfish earlier, and lets out a disturbing laugh as he asks what's in her hand. She reveals that they're his eyelashes and that he'll be cuter if he puts them on. He tries to protest, but the girl is already out of control, insisting that it's his punishment after all. The boy requests advisory recommendations, shouting that her condition is not normal. She pushes him forward, saying he also needs style development parts, not just stupid muscle development parts. Later on, she tells him to lay down as she takes care of his internals. Although obedient, he argues that he's perfectly fine and moves his coil once a month. Apparently pushing a strange switch, she drabbles on about technical engineering stuff. Automata can be shut down by their master's voice print, but he hates sleeping. She bids him good night in sweet dreams, uncannily similar to how his creator used to. Zuki now has a fresh set of eyelashes. Kanon tells him to show his face, so he complains about having strange parts added to his body. She insists that they aren't strange, and that he looks much better when walking with confidence. In the school hallways, people are flocking over someone's presence. It's the daughter of the Vampire King, Major General Crimson Rose of the Scarlet Maidens. Recognizing the name, he quickly runs away, but the familiar lady runs after him. She throws a sword his way, lodging it in a wall to stop him, and expresses how nice it is to see him again. He doesn't share her sentiments, guessing that their encounter must not have been a coincidence. She admits that she's investigating according to her father's orders, and notes that he's still wearing the same uniform. The lady asks if the uniform suits her, but he ignores the questions and asks what she wants to do with him. She only came to confirm what she saw. The Hercules units at the site had their coils and chips destroyed with pinpoint accuracy. After asking around, she was able to confirm that he was the only one there. In other words, he destroyed 20 automata that were running wild, without any equipment. She takes his hand, and he wonders how to escape. To his surprise, she brightly shouts that he must be an incredibly powerful human being. Still holding his hand, she confirmed that he has the body temperature of a human. The general thought that only a vampire would be that strong, and is amazed to find a person like him. Relief washes over Kanon's heart. Zuki realizes that she didn't even think that he'd be an automata. He asks if she was tediously transferred just to confirm his race, but she says it's not just the case. Finally asking for his name properly, she comes close and tells him to give her his blood. Everyone is stunned, as the beautiful girl awaits his response. However, he blatantly declines and walks past the vampire. Kanon urgently chases after him, explaining that what she did was a vampire's version of a love confession. Scolded for giving a particularly harsh refusal, he asks how he should have done it instead. The girl suggests making something up, like not thinking about dating, but the vampire loudly complains, saying she can hear them well. Regaining composure, she finally introduces herself as Rita, the third daughter of the Vampire King, and asks the boy for his blood once more. He blankly lets out a nicer rejection spiel, much to her frustration. It's courageous of him to refuse, but he has no right to say no. She's not asking if he's willing, instead, the princess is giving him an order, and the honor to dedicate himself to her. Vampires are able to charm and control humans with magic, especially when they've sucked their target's blood. To her greater surprise, he states that just the thought is ridiculous. He isn't sure what she really is, but having his blood taken would turn him into a slave. Zuki states that he's already in a relationship, adding that he'll gouge her heart out if she doesn't get lost immediately. Lastly, he states that he'll never be her toy and walks away, making his answer clear. Insulted by the rejection and the threat, Rita fumes with anger, 
and challenges him to settle things with a match. Canon advises against the fight and tells him to apologize instead. The vampire finds this boring, but says she'll accept it in exchange for his blood. The human girl offers her blood as a substitute, but trembles as the vampire glares at her. She declines the offer, saying she wants to feel his body, as she drinks the blood directly from his veins. Determined to make him mine, she makes a stunning declaration that he'll never escape. For some reason, other students have printed posters of their fight and are announcing it throughout the school. Wondering how it's come to this, Kanon scolds Zuki, saying his identity will be revealed because of his immaturity. He's confused about why she's so pressed, when there's no chance of him losing the battle anyway. The princess wants to suck his blood, but she doesn't know that it contains mercury, something extremely toxic to her kind. His identity is at risk, so she makes him swear to win the match. He obeys, but Kanon frantically clarifies that he mustn't kill her either, as doing so will reveal his identity all the same. She tells him to be careful once more, so he complains about having it repeated too many times. As one last addition, she tiptoes to his ear and tells him to never forget that she's his master and that he can never belong to anyone else. The crowd gathers behind the school, excited to watch the match. Rita greets Zuki, glad that he didn't run away like she expected. He says he has no reason to run, adding that he's grown sick of their arguments. Sharing his sentiments, she wants to end it quickly and enjoy his blood as soon as possible. Setting the rules of the game, they decide on a one-on-one -on -one battle. She lays out the variety of weapons from their armory and tells him not to worry about the expenses. He asks how the victor will be determined, so she tells him not to complain about the fairness of things. Their races are equal under the treaty, but it is an undeniable fact that vampires have much higher physical abilities than humans. Under normal conditions, the battle would be one-sided and his defeat would be meaningless. He argues that her pride might bring an unexpected result, so she shoots his confidence down. In this case, victory for him would be achieved by landing a hit anywhere on her body. Humans are always hiding in armor, so these terms would give him many places to aim at. He asked about her wind condition, which she hadn't really thought about yet. Moving close, she tugs on his tie and points at the second button on his shirt. The vampire wins if she grabs that button, so it'll be the only thing she aims at. Since humans get injured quite easily, she promises to accept his surrender, adding that fleeing from the schoolyard also counts as defeat. They finalize the conditions, and there won't be a need for judges as the crowd of students will be watching them. She takes out a rapier and tells him to pick out a weapon. He unhesitatingly decides on a sword, making her question why he wouldn't choose a firearm. He assures her that it won't be an issue, and reminds her that there should be rewards for either's victory. Her desired reward is his life and obedience. Quickly accepting, he states that his reward is for her to never ask for his blood again. Insulted by the shallow demand, she considers his odds of winning, deeming it to be less than 10 million to 1. The vampire vows to obey his command eternally and gets ready to fight. Standing proud, she tells him to come and show her what he's made of. Remaining on guard, he wonders how many attacks she'll fake as he knows that things won't end well if he isn't careful. Dissatisfied that he isn't attacking, she dashes in to make the first move. He puts his blade up to defend her lunge, but is surprised to see his opponent disappear, right as their blades were about to touch. As he looks around to find her, Rita's faintly announces her attack, and he's able to raise his blade in time to stop her. Although he successfully defended, she knows that the match is already over. He recognizes the ability as Nebula, the power to erase any substance, and the limit is 10 seconds. Things would be much worse if he didn't know where she was going to aim. She mocks him, saying he's lost all the confidence from earlier, and reminding him what he's up against. By the school building, the teacher watches beside Canon, saying things have become quite troublesome. If he comes across students fighting on campus grounds, it's only natural that he must do something about it. Moreover, he's the princess guardian, but vampire-associated issues are often complicated. Watching the match, he says he couldn't see her rapier at all. Kanon says Zuki's reflexes are good, something the teacher agrees with. He's above average in all fighting aspects, as proven by his exam results. She says he's simply a hard-working person, but the man asks what kind of thing the boy is. His background is unknown, and their investigation has proven that their claim to be cousins is a lie. He blatantly admits that he's investigating the boy, and he asks her if keeping someone like him close is a good idea. Annoyed, she tells him off for interfering, stating that she at least trusts him more than she does the Archduke. The boy's blood relation with her mother gives her enough faith that he won't abandon her. Her mother probably hadn't thought of it, but using a back even is genius. Rita calls Zuki boring as he didn't land a single strike on her, mocking him as it seems like he doesn't want to hit a girl. 
He denies this, saying that he doesn't care about the gender of vampires. The girl further goads him into attacking. As a result, he charges toward her, but is surprised that she easily dodges his attack and aims at his button. To protect it, he uses his hand, which gets injured in return. She mocks his way of fighting, saying that he must surrender as he won't be able to land an attack on her anyway. She then looks at her sword, laced with Zuki's blood, with fascination curious about what it will taste like. Seeing her interested in his blood makes him alarmed, thinking that his identity will be revealed if she gets a taste of it. As she tries to get a sip of it, the boy quickly moves to stop her, using his sword to slash in her direction. Rita is surprised by his attack, as she clearly underestimated him. She quickly distanced herself, much to the boy's surprise. Enjoying the fight, she tells him that it was a long time ago since she became obsessed with the blood of someone, and because of Zuki's blood, she can't think of anything else. Hearing her desperation for him, the boy slashes himself, making everyone gasp. In disbelief, the vampire princess questions him about his foolishness. Menacingly, the boy tells her that he intends to make her lose her mind over his blood during their fight. His blood splutters toward her, making her lose concentration during the fight as finally his sword strikes hers. Regaining advantage, he declares that he'll strike her body next, urging her to surrender. The vampire refuses to do this, not caring if she's at a disadvantage with her broken rapier. She throws her sword aside, telling the boy that it's her first time to fight in such an intense battle that makes her excited. She praises his capabilities as a human and tells him that they stand on equal footing. For these reasons, she will fight him without reservations and take out her blood sword, Pornado Rose. The boy feels a little intimidated, as the sword is imbued with sorcery exclusive to those with royal vampire blood. She declares that playtime is over and urges him to surrender. However, confident in his prowess, Zuki tells her to brace herself because she'll definitely lose the match and beg. Provoked, she slashes her sword and creates a strong gush of wind. However, because of this, Zuki can move to his heart's content without his opponent seeing his true agility. He easily closes their distance, and to her surprise, he strikes his sword towards her heart. In doing so, his sword breaks because of her winds. He notices that his opponent isn't moving, and when he looks back, he sees her unclothed because of his attack. Out of embarrassment, the girl runs past him, screaming, and before he can react, she is out of his sight. By running out of bounds, the vampire princess lost the match. The next day, Rita approaches the boy, awkwardly asking if he needs anything from him. He denies this, saying any tricks up her sleeve won't work on him, and she can't have his blood. Feeling insulted, she tells him that a royal blood like her won't break promises, especially since she lost against him. Gathering her courage, she lets him know that since his victory is established, he can make her do anything he wants. However, the boy is not interested in the slightest and tells her that leaving him alone and not drinking his blood are enough. Insulted, she chastises him, saying that she's being serious and giving him the right to command her. Since he humiliated her in front of the whole school, he can humiliate her even more and even take something precious from her. Hearing this, Kanon is incredulous, chastising the boy. Zuki clarifies that the princess is pushing it on him, demanding that he order her around. Kanon tells the vampire that the boy will be fine as long as she won't ask for his blood. However, Rita refuses to accept this, as she believes men always have something they desire. Knowing that she won't back down, he commands her to join their team for the automata contest, shocking both the girls. Kanon asks Zuki why he invites the vampire to their team. He tells her that since she's offering her services, they might as well use her. Now that they have a new member on the team, she suggests that they practice with her for the contest. She reminds him that since Rita is now a teammate, he can't fight or provoke her, and they must work in peace. The boy relents, saying he'll try. Later, they see Rita patiently waiting for them at their meeting spot. She perks up upon seeing Zuki, commenting on how good he looks in casual clothing. She notes that he must be excited, thinking that it's a date between them. Seeing him getting annoyed, Kanon intervenes, saying that it is not a date between the two since she's the one who planned the meetup. As they walk towards their destination, Kanon thanks Rita for joining their team. The vampire tells her that there's no need to thank her, as it was a command from her master. Seeing her clasping her hand in Zuki's, Kanon tells her off. The vampire just laughs at her, saying she became Zuki's property after losing their duel, so it's only right. Kanon argues that it isn't Zuki's order, so she must let go of his hand. The two girls banter, with Rita saying that Kanon is acting like a jealous girlfriend of Zuki when she's not. She further claims that the boy enjoys her touch and proceeds to move her body closer to him, asking if he enjoys her company. Hurt, Kanon does the same, asking the boy what he thinks of her. Meanwhile, Zuki is just confused about the point of their argument. 
Remembering that they're on a mission, Kayon informs them that she arranged the meeting to do research on automata to help them come up with a unique idea. She then brings them to the National Automata Historical Museum, where they can study for the rest of the day. She guides them inside, saying it is the biggest automata museum in the world, with 100,000 of them. Rita is surprised to hear this, as this is her first time in the museum. Spooked by her enthusiasm to teach everything she knows about automata, Rita asks for Zuki's help, but he scrambles away as she's being dragged by Canon into the research area. As the boy walks further inside the museum, he walks straight to an area he seems familiar with. He touches a glass, and it reveals the battle machine, Bakuden 2nd edition Kisaragi. He looks intently at the automata inside, which is meant to eradicate the vampire race. He calls it brother, asking why they exist. Later, at a restaurant, Kanon is discussing that galaxy gears are troublesome, and she is still pumped up about automatas. Exhausted, Rita is distracted and can't keep up with her anymore. She chastises her for not listening, emphasizing that gear is the most important part of an automata, and the harmony gear is the most useful. This part got the attention of the vampire, confirming if Kanon is referring to the harmony gear that Automata Bakuden used to slay many people. Kanon confirms this, saying they can stop the meeting if she's not comfortable talking about the machines that killed many of her kin. However, Rita assures her that she is fine talking about Automata, as she wants to be part of the team. She adds that it is humans who hate the machines and vampires respect their enemies, acknowledging that Bakuden was the only thing capable of threatening them. She actually feels excited to be part of the team that will build an automaton. Just then, they notice Zuki putting a lot of hot sauce in his meal. Curious, Rita takes a bite of what he is eating and almost cries at how spicy it is. She is also shocked that he eats the shell as well. Trying to hide his real identity, Kayon tells her that he just has a weird palate and pulls him to the side. She asks him how many times he has eaten a meal before. Thinking that his human impersonation skills are perfect, he proudly tells her that it's his fourth time. In disbelief, she tells him that he is nowhere perfect about it, and he better keep a low profile. They go back to the table and see that Rita ordered desserts while they're gone. She quickly offers a bite to the boy, prompting a jealous reaction from Kanon. Because of this, the two girls banter again, with Rita accusing Kanon of monopolizing the boy. The latter denies this, saying that she's only looking after him like a responsible cousin should. She tells her not to be nosy and to remember the agreement they had. Rita points out that she only promises not to suck the boy's blood, but she never said she's not going to be close with him. As the two continue to banter, Zuki suddenly feels like he's going to throw up from too much eating and runs. After exiting the bathroom, he bumps into a man saying that he should run because the Vampiral Revolution Army just took the humans at the restaurant hostage. Zuki rushes to save the two girls, worrying about Kanon. The Vampire Revolution Army is known to enslave humans, and even the vampires in Hellweights hate them. He reaches the back door, where he is spotted by one of the soldiers. He raises his hands as a sign of surrender saying that he's just visiting the museum. The vampire soldiers drive him away, but he pleads with them to let him in, as his sister is still inside. He offers up his blood in exchange for granting his request. One of the soldiers happily takes up his offer and starts to suck his blood. As soon as the man's fangs bit into him, he annihilated both of the soldiers, declaring that his infiltration was a success, and he proceeded to rescue the hostages. He walks into the building, pretending to have been charmed by the vampires. As the monsters ease their defense, he starts attacking them. He reaches a room where vampires enslave some humans. The vampires are quite surprised to see a charmed boy offering to be their meal. Although thinking of it as warped, one of the vampires pulls him to suck his blood. However, the creature is surprised by how disgusting the taste is. Irked, the vampire attacks him, but he easily evades and slays all of them. He then looks at the girls and tells them that they can exit through the back door. Seeing him execute all of the vampires, the girls shake in fear and run away, calling him a monster. Zuki, who's grisly covered in blood, laughs. Finally, he feels alive, as he's fulfilling the very reason why he's been created. Meanwhile, at the banquet hall, Rita is starting to lose her patience with the soldiers and tells them that they can't get away with what they did. In a corner, Zuki is hiding thinking of ways to save the hostages. Rita threatens the vampires that they're going to be imprisoned after this ordeal. This irritates one of the soldiers, who points a gun at her. She sneers, saying that the weapon won't have any effect on her. She points out that their bullets are of low quality and won't work on her unless they're silver. Insulted, the soldier fired at her, but it didn't even phase her. To Kanon's astonishment, the girl's wound disappears quickly, thanks to her vampiric regenerative ability. Rita is annoyed that her clothes are now ruined and swears to make the soldier pay. The man is surprised to discover that she's a vampire, 
as they told them to evacuate the area. She refuses to leave her friends behind, and she orders the soldier to surrender and drop his weapon. Just then, a man enters the hall and greets Rita. She is surprised to see him, calling him Valhelm. He then asks her to call in her brother Yuli. Rita is surprised that the leader of the revolutionaries that are attacking the restaurant is a vampire she is very familiar with named Valhelm. Zuki is secretly watching their interaction and realizing that he is looking at the group's leader, he plans to take him down so the squadron of enemies will collapse. Meanwhile, Rita faces the enemy leader and demands that he surrender the hostages as well as pay for all the atrocities he has committed. However, Valhelm sees nothing wrong with what he is doing, believing that a vampire with noble blood like himself owes nothing to lowly creatures like humans. He goes on about the superiority of vampires compared to humans and how humans are meant to be controlled by them like slaves. The vampire princess stands up to his words, declaring that her father sees humans as their equals, and so he wants to protect them, something she got to learn for herself. As they talk, Zuki is already aiming his knuckle guns, but he is hesitant to shoot since Rita is in his line of sight. His gut instinct is to shoot her too, since he sees her only as a vampire enemy. However, he cannot put himself in the position to do it. Meanwhile, Rita continues to talk about human and vampire equality and how someone as prejudiced as Valhelm can never understand such a concept. Our hero hears her words, and it is keeping him from shooting. Rita goes on to tell the revolutionary that vampires and humans can coexist, and that she will fight if he lays a finger at any of them. Her words strike a chord within Zuki, and he finally stands down from his plan to shoot. Valhelm is disappointed in how the vampire princess has taken so much of her values from her king father. He looks at the princess body and sees that, despite her immature ideals, she has grown to be a fine young woman. Rita sees how much he is staring at her and covers up. However, the man does not see anything wrong with what he is doing since he is her fiancé after all. Canon hears the conversation, so Rita becomes defensive and tells her that their engagement had been cancelled seven years ago because of the peace treaty between humans and vampires. She is so ashamed of her history with him that she goes on a rant about how much she wants it to be hidden. Valhelm tells her that he has not given up on making her his wife, and that he has been thinking of ways to get her back for the past seven years. He magically summons a sword to his hand and declares that today will be the day he will persuade her father to get what he wants and for vampires to take control of Hellwaits once and for all. With his will, his sword gets wrapped in whip-like shadow magic that he uses to tie Kanon tightly and pull her to him. The devil smiles, all the while pulling Kanon's hair and looking at the scared expression on her face. Rita demands that he let her go, threatening the violence of her blood sword if he does not. However, Valhelm warns her that she does not have full control of her magic yet, and there is a huge chance that she might harm the hostages in the process. Rita does not give up and tells him that if the hostages are for negotiating power with his father to strike a deal, then she should be enough. She volunteers to be taken as a hostage in exchange for releasing all of the humans in the restaurant. Valhelm sees how committed she is to the ideals she got from her father and is disgusted. She tightens his hold on Kanon, and he threatens to slaughter the poor girl just to make the princess realize how insignificant humans are compared to them. Rita begs for him to stop, but the maniac does not listen to her plea. Zuki finally shows himself, charging at Valm with his blade, but an invisible force deflects his hit and misses. He does, however, manage to slice off the man's arm with a second attack. This makes the villain let go of Kanon and Rita catches her before she hits the floor. The vampire princess is glad to see our hero right in time to save them. Zuki is confused since Valhelm had no time to counter his attack and wonders who in the room could have done it. Valhelm is equally confused about how a young boy got inside all of a sudden. Our hero tells him that he came in from the back entrance, slaughtering all his men on the way. The shocked revolutionary leader tells his men to confirm what he just said, before his men can take a second of action, the Imperial Army charges in and demands that the terrorists release the hostages. Valhelm orders his men to retreat. As they run, Zuki fires his knuckle bullets at the enemy leader. Again, an invincible force interferes, deflecting all his bullets before they reach him. Our hero is shocked to see that there is a woman running beside his target, revealing the identity of the fast deflector. He reaches out his hands to her and screams her name, Mitsuki. Despite this, the woman continues to run with no answer, only giving off a cold stare. Zuki screams for his sister, the Bakudan Mitsuki. While the woman Automata looks at him, she does not stop running away. 
The young man is left standing in place, speechless after seeing his sister disappear without a trace. Kanon approaches him with a sad look of disappointment on her face. She tells him that she overheard the army investigators talk to each other about 37 fallen revolutionary soldiers who can only be identified through their clothes because they have turned into ashes. She is upset knowing who did it, and she questions the young boy about why he slayed all those vampires and in doing so, risked exposing his identity. The boy tells her that he could not have saved her otherwise. However, she tells him that it is not his responsibility to do so, and that he cannot keep on ignoring everything she says to keep him safe. Zuki gets angry at this, justifying that he was created for the sole purpose of eliminating the enemy, and so he sees nothing wrong with what he did, not to mention that if he did not go in and interfere, Kanon would not be standing right now. However, the young girl counters that her life does not matter if it means his identity gets exposed, since he will be destroyed or end up like his brothers and sisters, naked, disassembled, and displayed in a museum. Zuki counters that if having a purpose means he will be destroyed, then he is satisfied with the consequences. He resents her for waking him up in an era of peace, and he accuses her of intentionally doing so, knowing that he will eventually get destroyed and so he will end up like the other Bakudan units. Kanon cannot take it anymore and he slaps the automata on the cheek. He questions why she would do that, knowing he cannot feel pain. The young girl tears up, telling the boy that she never wants to see him destroyed since he is the only thing her mother left her with. She goes on to say that without him, she could never expose the lies talked about the Bakudin. She declares that the original concept of the Bakudin was love, a declaration that reminds Zuki of the girl's mother. Kanon tells him that she knows that it is true, and while she still cannot prove it, she is confident that the disaster at Kerner was never supposed to happen. She refuses to believe that the Bakudin units were meant to be weapons of destruction, and that her mother only made automata for war. She considers their being able to live together in peace as proof of this. Her words make Zugi think about why she woke him up, considering that it would have been infinitely easier to hide him if he just stayed asleep. He reminisces about how she would always wake him up out of bed in the morning for school, and how she would take him anywhere, no matter where she went. He wonders if the girl wants him to see the world and grow. Kanon continues to cry, complaining about how she does not want the world to see her mother and the Bakudin as evil, as well as to be bullied for using the Harmony gear. Zuki is speechless at seeing her so vulnerable for the first time. He thinks about all the times Kanon has been bullied and how, despite it all, she still tries her best to smile and show the world that her obsession with the Harmony gear is not dangerous. He realizes that it is he who has given up on fighting, not her. He finally speaks up, telling her that he will always listen to her from now on. This changes the young girl's mood, and it brings a smile to her face. At Valhelm's warehouse hideout, the vampiric revolutionary leader cannot stop complaining about how Zuki has annihilated his men in the restaurant, and he wonders how a human like him can do something like that. Mitsuki reveals to him that the boy is not human, but is one of Harami Bakudin's automata specifically designed to eliminate vampires. This fact shocks the vampire, who was under the impression that the Bakudin unit only had five members. She tells him that while there were only five that were deployed for combat in the war, the professor actually created six automatas, but the sixth unit was judged unfit for battle, so he was separated from the others. Valhelm thinks that it means his new enemy is defective, and he wonders what he can do about this fact. Elsewhere, Rita visits Kanon's house and hugs Zuki at first sight. Despite the princess visiting the boy for his anemia, there were actually some crucial repairs that Kanon needed to do to her beloved automata after the brawl. They tell Rita that after checking up with the doctor, they now know they have nothing to worry about. The conversation turns to the vampirical revolutionary army, and they all share their opinion that it would be easier if they got caught already. However, Rita thinks the biggest threat to national security right now is the Bakun who attacked the revolutionaries in the restaurant. Kanon becomes nervous after hearing this, and she asks the girl why she would think this is the case. Rita tells her that it is obvious because only a Bakudin can turn 37 vampires into dust out of nowhere. Since Mitsuki is the only member of the squad not yet found, she tells the two that the army's theory is that she is still alive. Zuki remembers what happened in the restaurant, and he has no doubt in his mind that it was his sister. Rita also reports that while the hostage crisis was going on in the restaurant, the Harmony gear on Kisaragi was stolen from the display in the museum. She theorizes that Mitsuki's Harmony gear is probably nearing the end of its lifespan and that she needs a replacement. However, Rita finds it strange that Mitsuki would slay the vampires if she and Valhelm are allies. Zuki, on the other hand, finds it strange that his sister is working for a vampire to begin with. The princess just stops questioning things, 
more preoccupied with her excitement at the possibility of seeing a working Bakuyan as well as the possibility of fighting one. The oblivious girl continues talking about how she heard that one cannot even tell that Bakuyan is human even if they are already talking straight at it, a thought that makes Kanon secretly sneaker. Kanon shares with Rita that she has an early blueprint of Mitsuki she wants to share with her. Much to the vampire princess' surprise, she shows the detailed pages of the book. While Rita is amazed, she questions how she got a hold of the blueprints. The nervous Kanon answers defensively that it is only a copy she made after seeing the real deal displayed in the museum. The vampire believes this flimsy explanation, making Zuki think that Rita must be a gullible girl. They turn the page to the early prototype drawing of Mitsuki, and they see that she was originally designed to be the perfect private secretary. Kanon explains that Professor Bakudin was not originally planning to make anti-vampire automata. She passionately says that her true intent was to create humans, something that amazes Rita. This makes Zuki think about how automata usually have a specific, predetermined purpose, yet he can still go to school and have a normal life. He ponders if this means the Bakudin's artificial brain is no different from a human brain, and looks for the blueprint for the cranium design. He is surprised to see that the drawing for the automata head area is blacked out. Later, Zuki and Kanon talk about Rito, while they clean the dining area. The boy thinks it was a mistake to bring her into the team since she knows next to nothing about automatas. This makes the girl laugh, who at least finds it funny that they can at least invite her anytime in the house without being in danger of being found out. Zuki checks into the workshop and sees that Rita is not there. He looks for her and finds that she is in his room, looking for something under his bed. She tells him that she only wants to take a sniff at his bed and school uniform. The naive Zuki thinks she might suspect he is an automata and asks if he found some kind of screw underneath, much to the confusion of the young girl. Seeing as this is an awkward moment, the vampire princess wants to leave immediately. However, the boy stops her, telling her it is okay. However, Rita says it is fine and that she does not want to find any weird videos lying around. The mention of videos makes Zuki get something out of his drawer and invite Rita to watch something together. He then tells her that he will turn off the lights, the same way he and Kanon always watch videos together, much to the princess' dirty mind. She tells the boy she is not ready for something like this. However, once the boy starts the video, she finds that the video is only a normal romance drama. Zuki asks what she thinks of the mood he sets and if it feels like a genuine movie theater experience. After being frozen in disbelief, Rita answers that it is fine and they should just watch the movie together. As they watch, the girl cannot help but look into the boy's face. She asks if he and Kanon always watch movies together, and he answers that they do. She then asks if he and Kanon are really the only ones in the house, so he tells her it is the truth. In the silence of watching the movie, she brings up the courage to ask if he has feelings for Kanon. Zuki does not know what she is talking about and asks what she means. The girl then brings up how they live together and how they always watch romance movies together. As the movie goes to the kissing scene, the boy reveals that he does not know what the meaning of the act is. He says he asked Kanon about it but she did not tell him and instead told him to figure it out by himself. As he nears his face on Rita's, he tells the bushing girl that he wants to know what it means. He asks her if she would tell him what love in the movies means, which makes the nervous girl close her eyes. As their two lips are about to touch, Kanon comes into the room and opens the lights. She is annoyed to see that the two are doing something weird. It is time for Rita to go home, so Kanon tells Zuki to walk her to the nearest station. He warns the boy not to do anything to her, and since the boy does not know what she means, Kanon feels assured she has nothing to worry about. While the two walk in the dark street at night, Rita holds onto Zuki's arm tightly. She looks around and then asks the boy if they should continue where they left off since there are no one around. However, the boy genuinely does not know what she is on about, making Rita furious enough to call him an idiot. She nears the boy and hugs him. As she does, she finds it hard to let go. She finally does, and she smiles at him. They bid each other goodbye. As the boy waves his hand, he contemplates not understanding the meaning of going to school and spending time together with friends. The only way he can come to an answer is that it means that the Bakuten are not just machines for killing. As he walks home, he contemplates protecting the life he has now, even if it means he and Kanon will go up against the entire world. He walks into the house and finds suspicious footprints. He runs into the dining room, and he is shocked to see that there is a note with a map, put in place by a kitchen knife tab at the table. He shouts Kanon's name, but there is no answer. Upon reading the letter, Zuki rushes to the address written on it. He knows that Valhelm is behind it and that he is trying to lure him to his warehouse headquarters. However, he doesn't care, as he has decided to live a life with Kanon. 
Just then, an attack comes from behind him, which he swiftly evades, but he sees that it comes from Mitsuki. She continues to attack him, but he just deflects all of her blows and does not retaliate. She urges him to fight back instead of running away, calling him childish for escaping because they're siblings. Against his wishes, he attacks her back using his bullets, but she easily deflects them. He contemplates that he can't fight against his sister, as she is impressive in battle, and he was never deployed to battles because he was considered defective. Just then, he sees Kanon walking outside the warehouse. Firing at Mitsuki, he plans on grabbing the girl and escaping. He tries to reach out to her, but she just tells him good night. Surprised by her actions, he sees bite marks on her neck, indicating that she's been charmed. He continues to reach out for her but his vision gets dark, and he falls asleep upon the command. Unconscious, he remembers his mother's voice, repeatedly commanding him to sleep. On the chair, she asks what color the soldier invaders appeared as on his thermographic sensors. He says they were all red, indicating their body temperatures to be those of humans. She asks if humans are his enemies, to which he blankly replies no. Asked why he attacked them anyway, his eyes suddenly became alert, reasoning that he thought she'd be killed. She doesn't accept his answer, and asks what program was initiated, to allow him to judge whether or not it's acceptable to attack humans. He insists that he couldn't allow her to be killed, and thought he had to protect her. Looking disappointed, she says that he isn't answering the question she asked. Because of this, he was deemed defective. As he's wondering when he'll be able to see his mother's face light up again, a voice wakes him up, initiating his booting process. With mechanical eyes, he greets Valhelm, introducing himself as the sixth Bakudin, and thanking him for waking him up. To the vampire's satisfaction, the automata tells his new master to order him at will. By the wall is Kanon, who similarly wakes up following the vampire's charm. She sees Zuki and demands to know why he isn't answering her. Valhelm says that her screams won't change a thing, as the doll will only listen to his commands from now on. Identifying her as the daughter of Bakudin, he commends her for hiding the sixth model quite well. Explaining the situation, he shares how he charmed and ordered her to reset the boy's ownership module and adjust his thermograph setting. Terror washes over her face as she realizes that his goal was to take Zuki all along. He laughs at her innocence and declares his devious plan to gather the Bakudin and slaughter all the residents of the city. With this, the negotiations with the king can proceed, the peace treaty will be destroyed, and his engagement with Rita can resume. She says she won't allow him to turn her mother's creations into weapons and demands that he return Zuki. He scoffs at her, reminding her that they were designed for war in the first place. Since she's already served her purpose, he calls out to the automata and orders him to behead the noisy girl. The command rings out in his head, drowning out her screams for him to stop. But dolls will never betray their masters. He approaches her, his blade at the ready. She reminds him of their precious time together, living, schooling, and even going out on the weekends. Her tears fall, and she begs him to stop, but his eyes are completely blank as he raises his blade. Kanon begs Suzuki to stop, but his thermographic sensor detects her blue presence, identifying her as an enemy. He raises his blade, but his subconscious keeps flashing their memories in his mind, clashing with the repeated order to behead her. She desperately tells him to wake up, trying to remind him of who she is. Her tears begin to fall, but the voice doesn't stop. Wanting it to stop, he brings his blade down. Blood splatters throughout the room as he cuts his wrist open. His hand trembles, not from pain, but from trying to fight the control over him. He raises his hand and shoots the vampire guards around them, only hitting half of his targets. Valhelm repeatedly tells him to stop, unable to understand why the automat isn't listening to his commands. The voice in his head makes him stagger, filling his mind endlessly. He tells it to shut up, and he pierces his blade through his nape, breaking the chip buried in his flesh. The vampire is stunned that the automata won't listen to him, so Zuki says he destroyed the ownership module, freeing him from anyone's control. It's insulting that they even thought he'd kill his lady. He furiously asks if they see him as a vampire's toy that can be controlled by messing with his programming. The automata comes close to Valhelm, his true enemy. However, his weapon is unable to reach its target as Mitsuki comes between them, allowing the vampire to pull back. Taking Kanon by the hair, he orders the female automata to destroy the defective one. The human tries to struggle, but his charm quickly silences her, making her as obedient as possible. Zuki tries to go after them, but a throwing blade pierces his back. He tries to run, but the wall above him collapses from even more attacks, distracting him enough to get hit by a blade in the head. She asks why he won't fight her, saying he never changes. She was able to predict his stunt earlier, 
but avoiding battle is unnatural. He has no idea what she's talking about, so she recalls how he defied his master's orders, something unthinkable for dolls like them. When their mother was being attacked, he stopped working as intended and killed humans without being ordered to. In other words, he's a defective unit that can't stick to his program. Pulling the pick out of his head, he says he's well aware, but asks when she turned into someone who traumatizes others. She reveals that they all envied him. If they were like him, then maybe things would have turned out differently. Still running away, he questions what battle automata would want to be barred from the battlefield. Mitsuki remembers that he doesn't know how their mother died, and states that she was killed by humans. She opposed the mass production of the Bakudin, but the elites couldn't accept that and had her assassinated. Their frustration was indescribable, as they were forced to watch their supposed allies kill their mother. She'd still be alive if only they could break free of their restrictions like him. The strongest mechanized Automata Squadron and the heroes of Haravetsu, all those titles are scams. If she can't even protect her own mother, then what kind of hero is she? Zuki finally understands that the reason he wanted to fight so much was because his mother wanted him to. For everyone else, the act of going rogue was unthinkable, but the military rewrote their programming eventually. Now everyone is an enemy. She dashes in, and they engage in a flurry of attacks. Humans, automata, or vampires, it doesn't matter. The truth of the massacre is that their programming forced them to slaughter until they ran out of energy. She drives her blades into his chest and punches him back. With him, she finally has an opportunity to free herself from the corrupted program enslaving her. Mitsuki commands him to destroy her, wanting her sin of being a Bakudin to be ended by his own hands. He can only look on in shock, stunned by the command. Zuki stares at his sister, unmoving and unable to understand why she's asking him to kill her. How could he do so, if he's a defect thrown away by his own mother? Mitsuki says he's gravely misunderstanding the situation. He was labeled a defect because their mother wanted him to be deployed in battle, and he's the exact model she was aiming for. He turns away, doubtful. Continuing on, she says he was cared for the most among the six of them, as he's able to deny his programming and bond with humans. Their mother would endlessly study his brain, wanting to know what made him special. He burst into tears, demanding to know why he was abandoned. However, he wasn't abandoned, but given away. No matter what happened, his purpose was to protect her human daughter, Kanon. Their creator realized that the battlefield wasn't the only dangerous place, since the vampires could attack Hellweights and use their charm. All things considered, she would never give her own daughter, a defective model that belonged in the trash. He finally realizes that her words, telling him that he didn't belong there, weren't talking about the battlefield. It wasn't about fighting vampires, it was about protecting Kanon all along. Now understanding, he stands up and tells his elder sister to move away, insisting that there's someone he needs to save. She smiles at her brother's awakening and says it's foolish to think that she'd listen to an enemy's command. With this, he has no choice but to destroy her body, which is bound by her programming. With warm smiles and enlightened eyes, they begin their battle. The two dash in, their weapons at the ready. Zuki leaps above her, but she reacts by throwing her blades up. While they're aimed perfectly, he swiftly slashes with his arm, hitting her nape right on the mark, after catching her weapons in the holes in his knuckles. Mitsuki falls to the ground, and he says he saw right through her maneuver. It was just like his match with Rita, where his programming reflexively aimed right for her heart. Looking at her unmoving body, he wonders if she'll be free from her programming if her chip is destroyed. While trying it out, he's shocked as her face detaches, revealing a real brain in place of an artificial one. Remembering the black box of the Bakun blueprints, he realizes that they're able to feel and choose for themselves, thanks to this design. To him, it's the ability to love someone from the bottom of his heart. He rushes out of the building, thinking about saving Kana.